As most in this audience will know, the, the uh, <coughs> Society for the Quantitative Analysis of Behavior in conjunction with the Association for Behavior Analysis has arranged a series of tutorial lectures on major topics rel relevant to the quantitative analysis of behavior by the most distinguished researchers in the field. Today, we're exceedingly fortunate, fortunate to have Dr. James Townsend, Rudy Professor of Psychology at Indiana University, here to present perhaps the hottest topic in mathematical psychology of all, dynamical systems and chaos theory. Squab could not have chosen a more appropriate lecturer on this topic. Professor Townsend is a genuine mathematical psychologist, having contributed immensely to the field since obtaining his PhD from Stanford in 1966. He was trained there by William Estes, who many consider to be the founder of modern mathematical psychology. Professor Townsend's work, supported by many SFS, NSF grants, has spawned uh, topics of stochastic models of decision-making, uh, <clears throat> distinctions between parallel and serial, serial processing, pattern recognition, complex man-machine interactions, and most germane to today's topic, dynamical systems applications to psychological processes. He has served as president of the Society for Mathematical Psychology and as editor for the Journal of Mathematical Psychology. In recognition of his work, he's received many awards, including the Patel Award and election to the Society of Experimental Psychologists. The title of his talk today is From Basics to Contemporary Paradigms, Chaos. Please welcome Professor Townsend. like this with this group. Um, many years ago I uh, obtained my own uh, qualifying exams for the PhD in uh, animal behavior and animal learning, although I've drifted off in other areas. Uh, but I've always held high esteem uh, for those in this field, including yourselves, for the very great contributions that work in animal behavior has made to uh, scientific psychology. Now, uh, we begin with the title, which, uh, even though it's afternoon, I originally thought I was speaking in the morning, so uh, we'll have a little bit of time shift uh, here, albeit hopefully not a chaotic uh, time shift. Um, certainly, chaos is of such a level of abstraction in its um, most recondite being that uh, we cannot learn everything there is about chaos within a single hour of presentation. However, I will hope that I've structured uh, the talk so that not only will it provide motivation for more uh, effort on the listener's part, but that it together with some further work and perhaps viewing this video a few times will help you get started on your way. So for the uh, goals of the presentation, we'll go through the basic tenets and some pretty pictures, which uh, are often all that one really finds out in, in such presentations, but I'll try to go beyond that uh, into a discussion of the basic uh, tenets and axioms of chaos theory, but hopefully uh, with uh, some accoutrement and uh, demonstrations and so forth that will help uh, it to be more comprehensible and intuitive. We'll talk a little bit later on about the uh, means of application and finally end with uh, the pros and cons for behavioral science. basic fundamentals that we begin with, and pardon this not quite so uh, elegant uh, transparency, 
is the idea of a dynamic system. And the fundamentals of a dynamic system are, first of all, a state space, the points of which represent whatever kinds of entities that you as a modeler or a theorist are interested in. So, for example, the state might be some kind of mental state, uh, the position of an arm in motion, or whatever uh, is of significance for your own enterprise. Uh, dynamic systems can be discrete time, so we're like counting one, two, three, and at each step there's a change, a possible change in the state space, or it can be continuous time flow. We'll be emphasizing today the discrete time space, uh, which is uh, allowable for us to, to uh, be a little bit more intuitive than in the continuous dynamics, but uh, the basic truths are shared by both. Now, beyond the state space is a so-called map, or function, actually, that maps points to one another within the uh, state space. So we see here, for example, starting at the point x1, our function carries us then for n equals 1 uh, up to n equals 2 for um, at where the next state is x2, after the third iteration we're at x3 and so forth, the little dots indicating we move along, coming along finally to the position xn after n steps or n iterations. And this uh, is known, of course, the change to the different points is identified as the uh, trajectory starting at this particular initial condition, x1. So then reiterating, we, we see that uh, simply uh, given again down at the, the bottom here. Notice, uh, it's important to note that in this literature, often the n written as a superscript there means the nth step or iteration and not the nth power, not f multiplied by itself in times. Now before we move into the axioms of a chaotic system, let's take a quick look at some of the somewhat more prosaic behavior found with non-chaotic systems. So, for example, we have here an attractor. Um, typically, an attractor will be a fixed point so that if you began the system on that point, you never go anywhere. On the other hand, this fixed point now is part of a stable system in this little diagram where all trajectories in the neighborhood of that point eventually converge uh, to the point. Conversely, another fixed point, but this time acting as a repeller, will send nearby points fleeing away uh, from its neighborhood. A slightly more complex kind of behavior, but one that can be found with uh, linear systems, as can both of all three of these so far, is the idea of a saddle where certain parts of the state space may be attracted into a fixed point, whereas other parts of the space are sent away. You see this repelling action from other parts of this uh, space once you're off of that vertical line. Uh, and finally, we see a very regular kind of behavior, but one is, that is not found in linear systems, a so-called limit cycle, points around a neighborhood of the dark circle here will be attracted in toward that circle and begin to act more and more like a periodic motion as shown by the trajectory on the circle itself. Similarly, this one is a limit cycle both inside and outside the, uh, the uh, limiting set of points themselves. As you see, for inside we also get convergence out to the limit cycle. Now, uh, for our, the pretty pictures that uh, I promised, some beautiful examples of things. And the way these get their colors, the colors, of course, are not bestowed innately on, by the dynamic system itself. Those are given a little bit of help by uh, computer folks and mathematicians or engineers. But basically, they simply indicate qualitatively different behavior for different starting points in the space. And in particular, um, 
sets that are chaotic can be given a different color. So every point that's that's chaotic, for example, could be given one of those little tiny colors there. And, and that's we're going to see this as kind of a an elaborated version of a so-called Cantor set, and we'll see that all of a sudden unless you've already done this stuff, kind of mysterious, but we'll see uh, how that comes about in a simpler kind of venue a little bit later. In any case, uh, regular dynamic systems, even if they're nonlinear, won't give you that kind of pretty picture, very mysterious sometimes uh, kind of picture. Everything would turn out to be one or two colors, typically. This is just a little picture from, uh, as this other one was, from Michael Barnsley's Fractals Everywhere book, a real charming and yet quite rigorous book. It's getting used in a lot of undergraduate math programs these days. But I like this one. One of the properties that chaotic systems have from a geometric point of view is that on reduction, uh, you'll find so-called self-similarity or the pattern repeating itself over and over again as if you would take a snowflake and you look at the tip of the snowflake, that's another snowflake that's identical and so forth, and it goes on ad infinitum uh, forever in mathematics, and we can't picture it ad infinitum forever in, in our pictures, but we can approximate it. Now, with that a little ado to jump right into the meat of things, now, these are the fundamental definitions. This was offered by a mathematician by the name of Devaney about uh, a little over 10 years ago. Pretty much been accepted by the mathematical community and others that utilize uh, these things as models. The first one is sensitive dependence, and we can think of that, many of you have heard or read in other uh, articles about the butterfly effect, which uh, people argue about that, but where that arrived, uh, once that arrived, but most uh, suspect that it came from a story by Ray Bradbury where there's a butterfly that gets accidentally tromped by a time traveler, and then that causes incredible cataclysms uh, millions of years later. That's the idea that so you can change the initial conditions and the boundary conditions in the state space just a little bit, and yet huge effects can erupt from that uh, through time. And we're trying to capture that then in the uh, mathematical uh, fashion here. So this is just basically saying that our dynamic system, which is just defined by this function that, that carries the state space into itself, has this sensitive dependence on initial conditions, i.e. the butterfly effect, if there exists some number bigger than zero, so that for every member, every member of that state space, and for any member of that state space, for any neighborhood, any little region around that point, whichever point you've taken or picked, there exists another point in that, in our state space, and in fact in that little neighborhood, and that should have been stated, that got lost somewhere in the piping and some number of iterations later such that after n iterations these points will be greater than some delta, whatever this delta little number was. So no matter, the idea is very uh, reasonable intuitively is that no matter how close you pick these points, they're always going to end up some arbitrary number bigger or far away from another after a certain number of iterations. So it's very, I think, a very um, reasonable translation of our butterfly effect intuitions there. Now we can show that again graphically, either in the plane, which you'll find in the upper part of the figure, or um, on just in terms of, a, of the real line or numbers below. Let's look at it in the plane first. Okay, to start with, x and y are in a neighborhood that are not separated by more than delta, but after n iterations, they've drawn apart here, so that's obeyed. If they all do that according to the requirements, then you'll have uh, the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Here you see the thing here where you can actually see time along the x-axis, so steps in one, in two. Uh, and so forth going along here. Again, X and Y start out close, but after a number of iterations, they've drawn apart. So that's pretty reasonable, and that's really all that uh, the sensitive dependence is. But it's certainly one of the hallmarks of uh, associated with chaos. I should mention that even linear systems can show sensitive <coughs> dependence. An unstable linear system 
two points um, will often diverge from each other exponentially fast. So linear systems can al also show the butterfly condition, and we'll see later that it actually is somewhat redundant in terms of the uh, conditions for chaos. And I've drawn a number of pictures uh, in the presentation from a really nice uh, set of paperback books by Abraham and Shaw. I may have that title a little bit wrong, the Visual Encyclopedia of Dynamics, it might be an Encyclopedia of Visual Dynamics, I couldn't remember the presentation. Uh, it's really, uh, will help you very much along with certain uh, computer uh, tools perhaps to get a much more intuitive uh, understanding of these very really technical kinds of uh, things. So you really don't have to, I know this is probably too little to read, but I'll just fill you in on what we need to know. And, and all that's happening here is indicating on this particular well-known uh, chaotic system, which looks flat here. We'll see later very palpably that it's not flat at all. Um, but uh, we see this butterfly condition beginning to occur here, where points draw apart uh, from one another after uh, a cycle. Um, through the, uh, system, through the state space. The next principle or axiom of chaos is transitivity, and this word is, like a lot of words in mathematics, has more than one usage, and for those of you steeped in measurement theory or logic, uh, it's not going to be the same kind of transitivity, unfortunately, as P implies Q and Q implies R, then P implies R kind of transitivity. But uh, it's more of a topological kind of thing, and basically what it's saying here is no matter where, what two sets you pick in the state space, sets of things, sooner or later a trajectory from one's going to intersect that other one. So that's a kind of a mixing thing, and, and is needed in addition to this butterfly effect to make a, a system uh, truly chaotic. And here, as just stated in uh, more technical conditions, they're open sets. Uh, we won't worry about that. Uh, topologically, it's not very deep, but we really don't have time to, to do it. The basic thing is, again, that we're starting with any two sets of points, and a trajectory from the point in one will always sooner or later go into the other. Again, ordinary regular systems don't do that kind of thing. And there's a slightly stronger condition that's even more intuitive that's called mixing. And that really is very, in fact, it's exactly the same dynamically of what happens if you drop a spoonful of ink into a glass and sooner or later that ink is through the whole glass <coughs> of uh, water. That's a, a little bit more strong a condition than the transitivity. So again, it has considerable uh, intuition attached to it. Yes. You want me to go over here? I can if I take this. <laughs> I guess I can do that. Maybe these people over here won't like it. Let's see if I can reorient myself here. Oh, okay. That wasn't for you personally. Uh, I thought you were pulling around here. But. <coughs> My words are going to come out right to left instead of left to right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I hope they're not chaotic. Semantically, they might be chaotic. Um, here we see in the top is just a, a, a freebie here, as we see kind of a, a non sensitive or non butterfly effect, insensitivity to initial conditions. This attractor basically. Uh, gets everything like a black hole sooner or later, so uh, everything goes in there. Um, in the transitivity, though, this mixing kind of thing we see taking place again with these diagrams. It's a little bit difficult, but in fact, it's impossible to tell the difference between this and the, and the butterfly effect, but you can show quantitatively and with a lot of effort, you can show somewhat graphically that not only are the initial points um, expanding this initial neighborhood, expanding all over the place, but they come back sooner or later to where they started too. So it's that kind of uh, mixing kind of stuff that's, uh, that's going on. And the third one, and then things will be a little easier for a, for a little while, is 
we need the notion of a density, yet uh, another term that's got more than one usage. Many of you are familiar with probability density functions. And this is a notion that, that's very useful in mathematics, in both applied and uh, pure, in that we say one set that's contained, for example, in our bigger set, J, is dense in J, if for any member of J, basically I'm just going to translate this mathematics back into English. For any member of J, there's a member of this special set A that's arbitrarily close to it. Okay. So that kind of makes sense of what we might want to think about dense. You can't find any points in J that aren't close to a point of, of A. And our, probably our best everyday example of that is thinking of the rational and irrational numbers is that both of those sets of numbers are dense on the real line or on any even on any particular interval, like the 0 to 1. So for example, if we pick a number q, a rational number, and any number at all, say 1 millionth, there will be a rational number within a millionth of an inch or some whatever unit you pick, uh, close to it. So that, again, I think, uh, helps us understand what density is, and we're going to need that in a moment. In fact, right now, I don't think this name is, is particularly felicitous, and, uh, but with the vein he used it, so I'll use it. So if you study some of his books, they're certainly some of the most popular uh, introductory treatments of this. We'll call this dynamic system, uh, we'll say that it has an element of re regularity if periodic points are actually dense in that. Again, it's not unusual for a state space or a system to have some points that are periodic. But to have periodic points spread throughout the system so intensely that they're dense in the set, that turns out to be a very uh, important and, and critical aspect of, uh, of chaos. So, but since we think of periodicity, things coming back to the same place as being regular, that's, that's uh, presumably why you use that term, element of regularity. Uh, so here I blocked out the x and y because again, those were, the way I did it here in, in uh, hand makes more sense with regard to the definition. So what we're saying here, no matter where y is, in the overall state space, J, and no matter how close to it you demand any other point to be, there will always be a point that close that's periodic. So after some number, maybe 2, maybe uh, 20, some number of steps, it will come back to itself. And these are throughout the whole space. So again, that is a pretty uh, strange kind of thing to require of a, a dynamic system. This diagram can be used for, for many purposes, and the usual purpose is to show as you change a parameter, you start out with a very regular kind of system for some values of the parameter. And remember, this isn't time or the dynamic itself. This is just a parameter in the system. Uh, so if it's here, there are just two points. You've got periodicity here. Okay? And these are, it's not shown here, but they could be in any given system, either attracting or repelling. Cells. You go through and it's called period doubling bifurcations. Now the system changes dramatically at this point of the parameter. And now you have four, a periodic system of four points. So it goes back like that. Now as you continue with these chaotic systems, it's not chaotic yet, but as you continue to move your parameter in this direction, you split off more and more frequently in a, in a very regular way that was given a special um, elegant treatment by Feigenbaum, and now bears his name as Feigenbaum's uh, constant. Uh, this splits up more and more and more frequently until the system actually becomes chaotic. And at that point, one of its properties will be to have these periodic points dense in the whole space. And so in a way, you can kind of see that, uh, that occurring there. So, then summing up, we will say that uh, we'll call a system chaotic if, and in a, the typical 
typical tendency of mathematics, maybe I shouldn't say this, but uh, sometimes seems like it to make things more obscure than they really are. Um, any definition of mathematics means if and only if, but they never say that. I, I, it really confused me when I first started to study mathematics. Seriously, I said, so how can this be a definition? It's just an if-then statement. But they always mean, uh, I finally learned one day, that uh, it's if and only if the following things occur. So we have our kind of uh, mixing it up kind of property. We have our butterfly effect kind of property. And we have infinitely many periodic points spread throughout in a very dense way throughout the system. And that's really the element. Everything else will come out of, out of those axioms or assumptions. And I'd kind of like to give you a little of uh, the latest, uh, the latest uh, kind of results uh, here. It's turned out there's uh, been recent work by uh, mathematicians that have shown that, as I intimated earlier, that the sensitive dependence is kind of um, a Johnny Tagalong in the sense that if you assume transitivity, in that element of regularity that those both together imply the butterfly effect. Okay. These are sufficient conditions, too. They're not necessary because, as I mentioned, the linear system can produce this. So in a sense, even though we have more intuition about this than the others, it's kind of not really the, the crux of the matter. And furthermore, you can show that in general spaces, neither of any of the other two implies the, the third. So in general spaces, these guys are really the, uh, the critical, the critical uh, deals there. Now, what are some other aspects, though, now that we've got sort of a definition of what a chaotic system is, is like? Well, one of the things is, is fractals. Another is the dimensionality of the fractal. So, for example, you're interested, if you're a scientist or a mathematician, suppose you've got a, a chaotic set of points that's an attractor in the system. Then, no matter where you start, it'll get closer and closer to this chaotic system. It'll begin to act more and more chaotically, and it may pounce right into it. Well, the fractal aspects are a geometry thing, but you may thereby be interested in what the dimensionality of this subspace is, both for practical and scientific reasons as well as mathematical reasons. Well, it turns out that a lot of these systems don't have dimensions like one, two, or three, or four, well, like we're used to, but they're fractal, and fractal is a nice uh, word. I don't remember somebody like Mandelbrot invented that. Uh, but basically it means a fra you could have a fraction dimension rather than a whole number dimension. Well, where does that come from? Well, we can give some, I think, uh, pretty intuitive explanations and examples uh, at the same time with both of these together. And we won't be able to do like everything today, but of course. Uh, this thing looks a little bit esoteric, uh, but we'll show how to reach that with a little bit of algebra and uh, a tiny bit of uh, first semester calculus thrown in. <coughs> Let's motivate the idea, though, of how we could move in to get a definition by starting with something simpler, something that will not have a fractal dimension. <coughs> so, for example, starting with a circle or sphere, um, let's look at the sphere first, and then I'll do the circle to actually do the math because it'll be easier. But let's suppose that we're going to uh, make up something that relates an approximation to the whole thing in order to get a volume. So we want to get the whole volume of the sphere. Okay. Well, each box is going to have whatever the size of a side is, the length here cubed, or times itself three times. That's the volume of that little cube. And then that's times the number of boxes in the whole thing. Well, that's going to give us an approximation to the overall volume. Okay, so that, that central uh, reasonable idea will be the our uh, 
fulcrum for leveraging ourselves uh, through the understanding of the system. So therefore, we can now try to generalize that idea and say whatever our dimension is, it should be the length to the dth power instead of cubed, as in the special case for three-dimensional sphere, or sphere, two-dimensional sphere, three dimensions, however you want to look at that, times the number of boxes then that same idea we're saying should be generalizable. And of course, that's one of the big things mathematicians have been doing ever since probably the Babylonians and certainly the Egyptians and Greeks. So we're going to generalize that idea. We'll say that should work even for D, even if it's not a whole number, positive number. Well, you know, for our purposes, we don't care. We can always change the unit, so V over here is 1, and it's going to be a constant anyway, so let's just set it equal to 1 arbitrarily. It doesn't matter. Okay. Now we're going to take the logarithms of both sides, logs of things that are equal are going to be equal. So, doing that and using the properties of logarithms, we simply get that this sum is equal to zero. And now we simply solve algebraically for D in terms of the other guys. And lo and behold, we have at least an approximation of a definition for D for an arbitrary case, for an arbitrary kind of space. And then that, uh, using the calculus, we say, well, if that's approximate, let's squeeze down our little boxes more and more and take the limiting case as being our definition of D in general. So that's all we're doing is taking the boxes smaller and smaller and smaller and uh, producing then that in the limit. Now let's see, I think we have time, let's see if that works in the in a special case like a circle. So it turns out to be a little easier computationally to use little circles inside instead of spheres, so let's use those instead of, I'm sorry, instead of boxes, so let's use those instead of boxes. So we'll fill up, and I've just got some of them here, we'll take the circle, we'll make uh, the radius one, doesn't matter for our purposes. We'll make a little circle size at the nth step just equal to one over n, so the radius is squeezing down of these guys every step we take. To fill up the big circle, little circles, we make them littler in that way. Then, of course, the area by pi r squared is just pi. Uh, and the area of the r epsilon ball is pi times one, or one of these little balls is pi times uh, r squared. r is 1 over n, so it's pi 1 over n squared. So we approximately need, in terms of the total number of balls to fill the sphere, approximately pi, the area of the big one, over the area of the little ones. That, of course, will give you a reasonable approximate number, and that turns out to be uh, n squared. And now I'm going to be, you know, we're bypassing a little bit of the algebra and stuff here, which uh, we could do if we had a little more time, and, and then we get to the point, this is just a placeholder because I didn't feel like writing a whole formula down again. Uh, we get then to basically what we said we were going to do when we solved for D and took the limit. But taking the limit as uh, the circles get littler and littler, same as letting n get big, of course, right? Because the size is going over n. So you just do the algebra and then take the limit. We find out that everything cancels out in, in such a way that, in fact, you end up with 2. Well, that's great. I mean, we would be very disappointed if that didn't turn out to be 2 since it's in a plane. Okay, so the dimension of that circle should certainly be 2. Well now hopefully we've propelled ourselves with enough inertia that we can attack the much more complicated um, case of Cantor sets. And Cantor sets are, were discovered by the mathematician Cantor in the 19th century and reportedly gave rise to immense criticism and uh, calls for his incarceration or being placed in mental institutions uh, because they're so weird. Uh, but now, as Mandelbrot and, and certain other people, uh, the meteorologist Lorenz and the mathematician Stephen Smale, began to see these things actually have a lot of uh, use in uh, reality and, and science. So we need to study the Cantor set a little bit. And basically, the idea is fairly straightforward. 
we simply start out by taking out the center third of a line of an interval here, and to make it especially simple, we'll just take, say, for example, 0 to 1 as our interval. We take out the middle third. These are going to remain in the Cantor set up until the next step, where we take out the middle third of those. Now, this is a good example of closed and open sets. We use the, this notation to indicate an open set. It doesn't contain its boundaries. This interval contains its boundaries on these ends. So like 0 to a third, all those numbers are contained in that interval where this does not have 1 third in it, but it's got everything up to that on that side. Anyway, we can't keep taking out these open intervals step by step. And then what we've got left after an infinite number of those doing that an infinite number of times would be the Cantor set. It's a little strange even to think about. But uh, it turns out to have these properties that just, again, drove mathematicians to berserk uh, at the time. And still, uh, we sometimes wish they weren't there, but they are. And uh, I'll just point out to one of these, uh, two of these, that, that together are especially uh, irritating or perplexing, as the case may be. And that is, at first, the number of points left in this Cantor set, after you've taken out an infinite number of these closed, uh, I'm sorry, taken out an infinite number of the open intervals and, and just taken all of what's left of the closed intervals, is that they're uncountable. And what we mean by that is not only that there are an infinite number of them, but there's so many, there's many of them as there are irrational numbers on the whole real line. And that's a lot. Like the rational numbers can be counted, 1, 2, 3, 4, even though it's an infinite number. And the irrationals cannot. So this is a lot. Now up until this point, <laughs> math, up until this point, mathematicians had always found that those subsets that had uncountable, the uncountable part, had all the measure. If you tried to measure it with a ruler or something, those uncountable number points had everything. But then you go on and you find out with this Cantor set, it has measure zero. So that, that's just totally flabbergasting. And it's still, you know, it's very difficult to get an intuition for that, of how you can have things with an uncountable number of points. And from one point, you can sort of see it. You know, that even though there's going to end up to be a lot of points, and it's hard to see they're going to be uncountable. But notice how separated they are. And it turns out that they're sufficiently separated that they don't have any measure. There's no way to attach a ruler to them in any sense to get any kind of measure. So there are a lot of properties that are, are quite bizarre about that set, and it shows up in these dynamic systems that we call chaotic. Now, probably our last big mental feat uh, for the hour will be to take our little algorithm that we worked out for the circle and apply it to this Cantor set. And so we'll have our different box sizes. My best way to do this. Can't hardly get both of these in here at the same time. But the box sizes, remember, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They're getting getting smaller by this amount, powers of one third. Okay, each time you take um, one third, one ninth, one twenty seventh, and so forth. So they're, they're getting smaller like that. The number that you're getting when you when you count them up, notice that there are two, then there are four, then there are eight, and so forth. So the number of boxes is going up as the power of two. So this, in this fashion, we then get the things that we want, the numbers that we want to put into our little algorithm for getting, uh, for getting the uh, dimension of this strange set. Well, we plug those into our num into our little formula, which is exactly the same as before, only we don't know what D is yet, and this is the way the box sizes are getting smaller and smaller, and this is N, which turns out to be uh, 2 to the N, and so you put those in, solve for D, take the limit as N goes to infinity, again, the N's just cancel out, so you don't even need the limit, and you get this number, and, so, and here then we see a fractional dimension. And that's all a fractal dimension is, folks. Some kind of disappointing takes some of the magic out of it. <laughs> and we can see, a, I think, a nice example 
graphically a fractal mic uh, microstructure by taking the same dynamic system as Rissler's uh, band. We're emphasizing here, you probably can't see that back there, but it's a thick surface, meaning it's not a pancake, it's just been ruffled up a little bit. Cannot be a simple sur surface with like two layers glued together like it looks like. And let's take a closer look at how we could produce this by starting out with a set of points and using the function on them again and again. And basically, it takes this initial set of points that you could have lying in a straight line and folds them over. This. So already, you see, of course, they've blown it up so you can actually see this fold. You can't, it's done, been done a million <coughs> times in that other picture. You can't see what's flat. What happens the next time you go around? Well, now you take that and you fold that in half. And you just keep doing that. Every time it comes around, you fold it again, mash it in on itself. So here's after several times of going around and around, keeping folding these things up. Now, of course. If you were just on a single trajectory, you would have just started at a single point. It'd be wandering around here. Another property, by the way, that all uh, that's a little more intuitive than like transitivity sounds, but is closely related to that, is a, a so-called dense trajectory. So that means that even though you're starting from a certain point, after a long enough time, this one trajectory comes arbitrarily close to every other point in the space. It's winding around so much. So it's a very uh, what a, what a unique thing. Now, though, what the neat thing is here, that if we look at this cross section here, what do we find? Lo and behold, a canter set. The way these things are folding in on themselves again and again and again produces the weird thing, the weird example of a, of a chaotic, of, I'm sorry, of a canter set. So you can see like that's a third, uh, the middle third, then the middle thirds of what remains and so forth. It goes on forever, and that also has, in a, in a kind of simple way, not very pretty way, but it has that self-similarity, of course, so that within any crank canter set is another and another and another and another and so on forever. That, so that also ties three-dimensional um, dynamics in, a, in a, as a wrestler's band is, is a continuous <laughs> time dynamic to simpler things that you find with uh, discrete time dynamics. Now, another thing that Another approach to, to chaos, which is not nearly as well understood, uh, but certainly is a thing that we think about with chaos, and that is the way it kind of mimics uh, probabilistic systems. Okay. And we can associate that, associate that with so-called power spectrum. So a power spectrum, let me jump over here, and this is just showing like how you measure the thing. Um, here's a very simple thing. It's, Maybe continuous time or not, uh, but it's got a very elementary kind of uh, power spectrum, which just says it just divides out. And those of you who've done some things with sines and cosines, it's exactly what we're doing here. So it shows that there's power at just several different frequencies. Okay, so it's a very simple-minded system. You just have several several sines and cosines are making up everything, and we see that perhaps more graphically here. We have power spectrum of a typical periodic attractor. So you've got all the power at just some finite, this is the fundamental frequency and then harmonics of that, 2F, 3F, and so forth. Okay, but something that's a lot more chaotic, uh, where you have a continuous spectrum, a lot more like what you'd have if you just you take a, a system that we think of as completely probabilistic, like white noise, for example, um, has more of a continuous spectrum. Like that. So that's another property that emanates it uh, from a chaos, uh, chaos kind of system. And we'll see something that geometrically looks kind of similar to our Rissler's band, but it's actually very simple. This is to be thought of as in three dimensions. And notice that version, uh, maybe for certain values of the parameter in the Rissler system, is very non-chaotic. On the other hand, here is a chaotic system, but in a sense, you can talk about chaos as kind of a, a graded kind of thing. 
So there are systems that are really chaotic and some that are a little bit chaotic. So here we see one's kind of moderate chaos. It's got a lot of continuous spectrum in here, meaning you've got an infinite number of different periods and things going on in the trajectory. But you've got some spikes here, meaning certain periods kind of show up a lot more. They're really kind of dominating uh, the activity, as it were. And we can see a kind of evolution <laughs> as you move a parameter in a system like this and actually watch the spectrum get more and more continuous and smooth out so certain kinds of frequencies are not dominating everything as we change the parameter in the uh, dynamic system. So that's something that we really, uh, uh, is mathematically takes a, a rather different approach uh, using measure theory. Uh, all the other stuff we talked about uses topology and is hard enough to understand, but I think the major theory is probably even a little more esoteric. All right, let's talk a little about some areas of application of these things. And it's changing every day, so what's true today may not be exactly true tomorrow. It's been found that um, the structure, structure of the alveoli in your uh, lungs actually branch according to a chaotic system rather than a simpler one that they used to be. It's kind of defined in a more exponential kind of way. Um, medicine, it, it's <coughs> being used a lot in, in biophysiology uh, and uh, medicine. Uh, the heart uh, rhythm is one uh, place that um, have gotten a lot of attention. Um, there's been a little bit of mathematical modeling, most at the descriptive level, though. There hasn't been too much use of where you could actually use a parameter, for example, from the dynamic system to guide you in the kind of surgery you would do. Mm -hmm. Quite that nice. But nevertheless, it's coming along. Probably the greatest and most scientific use is in turbulence in uh, physics and engineering. There's an awful lot of uh, very powerful work going on in there. Meteorology, again, it's a little more descriptive, but as Lorenz was one of the great innovators early on, uh, the great red spot of Jupiter it was predicted by a chaotic kind of analysis uh, in a meteorological system. Ecology is another natural one, but it's, uh, and this is sort of half my opinion, uh, so <laughs> some, I'm sure people who work in this area are probably going to agree with me. Questionable whether any real examples are this my analysis for my review here. Uh, I take that with a grain of salt. Quantum chaos, something that we can't go into, um, pretty esoteric but fascinating kind of thing, and try to, you know, there's never been a, a really good um, underpinning, deterministic underpinning for quantum mechanics. And some people have suggested that uh, chaos might be a way to link up the determinism. Uh, in physics uh, with the, uh, the quantum kinds of probability aspects or stochastic aspects. Uh, but in any case, uh, that's, there's a lot of work going on, a lot of fermentation so far. I don't think results have occurred that all physicists would agree with. Now, what are some ways of, uh, obviously we have no time to get into the details, but one of the things you can do with data and I should mention it usually takes a lot of data, and you may or may not have that kind of data in a particular field, uh, but one is to look for a fractional dimension to try to make measurements on your data that will uh, provide an estimate of that. And that can be a rather difficult uh, way to do it, because what if you've got 1.0101, um, you know, is that dimension 1, or is that a fractional, it's just a little bit away from 1, so it's uh, another one that, that sometimes I go through uh, is the Lyapunov exponent. Um, that can also be generated, something we hear about a lot, but I can, since we don't have time to go into detail, I can just say that it's uh, related, especially when you apply methods to try to estimate the Lyapunov exponent. Lyapunov was a Russian mathematician pioneering in chaos theory a uh, few years ago. Um, the Lyapunov exponent kind of plays a role like in principal component analysis. So it's actually, it's kind of like eigen, an eigenvalue. It's, it's really quite nice to see those kinds of connections. Uh, we can look at the power spectrum. That's one of the more attractive uh, ways of doing it, albeit sometimes it's difficult to tell the power spectrum of a chaotic system from just a true random 
probabilistic stochastic system. Uh, you can look for strange attractors, um, and you can look for the butterfly effect, although again, the butterfly effect by itself would not really uniquely define a chaotic system. This is probably, this hasn't been done very often except in engineering and physics, but probably a better approach rather than just kind of passively trying to estimate things is to search for experimental variables that move one or more of those control parameters that can push you in or out of chaos. And just by being able to observe a vast difference or chaotic behavior for, for certain values of the parameter could go a long way in terms of uh, helping you to ascertain whether or not the system could be truly periodic. Again, it's probably best if it's tied to a, a specific kind of theory or model. Well, how about psychology? Let's just play like we're in the pub uh, at 11 o'clock in the night and going to uh, you know, getting expansive and speculative. So let me just try to um, play the angel and the devil's advocate kind of in a serial fashion, no pun intended, uh, here. Some arguments against might be, well, chaos is truly quantitative and numerical psychology needs qualitative an ordinary quantitative loss first. I understand the Skinner used to say that at, uh, actually many times in his career. Uh, number two, very little is known about multidimensional chaotic dynamics in most of psychology's Psychology hasn't the degree of precision necessarily to even necessary to even tell if a phenomenon is chaotic. And there's some people that are arguing there are a few small areas of research starting to open up where people would probably take issue of that. But it is difficult. And a number of areas, such as the use in ecology or epidemiology, a, a real Achilles heel of the research has been not having enough data to really determine how the system is chaotic. Psychology should avoid fads emanating from the hard sciences. It just leads to heartbreak. Unfortunately, we might rely on some of our clinical colleagues to help us get us through that. But uh, finally, we have enough irregularity in psychology. Let's look for some regularity, please. Now, fair enough. Let's look at the other side. Arguments in favor of pursuing chaos. Human behavior is very complex and therefore probably has to have chaotic dynamics somewhere. Uh, furthermore, there exist sub-disciplines in psychology, perhaps sufficiently precise as to employ chaotics numerically, maybe psychophysics, neuropsychology, animal behavior, and uh, For the rest, there are quantitative aspects of chaos that might be applicable to less rigorous areas of psychology. For example, alternating periodicities might be something that you could detect without having so much data and so forth. Maybe chaos theory, possibly like connectionism, perhaps is not nirvana, but it might stimulate psychologists to include and investigate more dynamics in their theories. That is less static and more dynamic, and I'm certainly a big adherent uh, of this, and that's one of the kinds of aspects of animal behavior I think that I've admired for many years is uh, they pretty much, you've been pretty much dynamic uh, through all the twists and turns of uh, the vagaries of psychology. Maybe psychologists who regularly resort to questionable probability models can find more convincing reasons for seeing irregularities in their data. <laughs> and I think especially our clinical colleagues probably would like to see that uh, advanced more with regard to individual differences. So let me finish off with this, uh, I don't know if it's a conclusion or a Chinese fortune cookie or what, but uh, go dynamic, but let chaos emerge, don't force it. <laughs> Thank you very much.